Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. I hope everyone had a good weekend and is doing well in this challenging time. I'm Eva Żarnowska, the application scientist here at Brooker Fluorescent Microscopy Business Unit in Madison, Wisconsin. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jimmy Fong. Jimmy is the product manager of Multiphoton Products at Brooker. He was awarded with undergraduate and graduate degree in biomedical engineering from the University of Wisconsin. While at college, Jimmy interned at the GE Healthcare in position of electrical engineer. In 2012, Jimmy joined Brooker as software engineer and quickly advanced his position through hard work and passionate approach to microscopy. In this webinar, Jimmy will present Brooker solutions to support all optical physiological experiments that involve simultaneous multi-photon imaging and holographic simulation. Before I hand the mic over to Jimmy, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. We would love to hear from you during presentation. If you have a question to, for our speaker, please feel free to send it through question tab at the bottom of your player. We will be answering questions at the end of the session. Please note that the recorded versions of this webinar will be available on demand in a few days of Brookard website. And last, we would like to encourage you to share today's webinar on your social networks. Please do not forget to add hashtag Brooker Nano Surfaces to your post. And to those who just joined, I would like to reintroduce Jimmy Fong, Multi-Photon Product Manager at Brooker. The title of his today presentation is Advances in Multi-Photon Imaging and SLM Holographic Stimulation. Jimmy, over to you. Great, thanks Eva. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, so to first give you a, some background about Brooker Larson Microscopy Business Unit. And we started in 2013 uh, with the acquisition of Prairie Technologies, which is a multi-photon and confocal manufacturer based in uh, Middleton, Wisconsin. And so like Eva said, I was with Prairie through the acquisition and it's kind of how I joined Brooker. Um, we're particularly known for our Ultima family of multi-photon workstations, which uh, the product line still continues today. And in 2014, uh, we grew by acquiring a single molecule localization company called Vitara out of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And then we grew in 2017 again with the acquisition of a white sheet company uh, called Luxendo out of EMBL and based in Heidelberg, Germany. So I'll mostly be talking about the uh, multi-photon uh, product line, but feel free to reach out to us if you have interest in uh, light sheets or um, single molecule localization. And so as an overview, I'll give a, a small introduction to uh, the two photon technique, uh, describe a little bit about uh, Brugger's involvement in, in the field, especially with regard to photostimulation, optogenetics, and caging, and then share a collaboration that um, had uh, that we had with key leaders in neuroscience to bring um, holographic stimulation uh, to the market. And then finally, uh, share with you uh, some of our newest evolutions in our, our system with uh, the Ultima 2P Plus is what we're calling it. And so to start off, uh, multi-photon is usually implemented usually as a laser scanning microscopy technique. Um, and this means that an excitation beam is focus to a spot in your sample through the objective lens. And the spot is rastered from top left to bottom right of your image by an XY Galbo set. And the fluorescence is collected at each point by the objective lens. And the emission optics and hits the detector, usually PMTs in this case, and the output of the PMT is uh, digitized. The scanning and the detection uh, of this process is synchronized so we know the fluorescence intensity at each pixel and an image can be formed. And so on the right here is an example of a scanned image from one of our users in immunology looking at uh, GFP T cells in, in a mouse depending or developing uh, diabetes. So what I just described is, is common to laser scanning on focal microscopy as well as multi-photon microscopy, or in this case specifically um, two-photon microscopy. And so the key difference, however, is in the fluorescence excitation process. 
So in 1p, a single visible photon excites an electron to a higher energy state, and fluorescence occurs at a wavelength that's further red um, compared to um, the excitation right here. The excitation profile for 1p is an hourglass, so a pinhole is needed on the emission path to block any fluorescent signal that comes from above or below uh, the focal plane. So for 2p excitation, instead of a single photon, two photons of half the energy or twice the wavelength arrive at the floor for at the same time to bridge the same energy transition. Um, so any fluorescence that is created is at a shorter wavelength than the uh, excitation. Uh, so for this process to occur, as uh, Maria Gobert Meyer described in 1931, there has to be sufficient uh, photon flux um, for this, this uh, process to occur. Uh, this means that fluorescence is confined to a small volume, a focal volume, instead of an hourglass, because um, the only place where this happens in a microscopy system is at the focus of an high NA objective um, at your focal plane. So why 2P? Um, so 2P has a couple advantages over a single photon confocal, for example. Um, the, lower, the longer wavelengths of photons are, are less prone to scatter, leading to deeper imaging. Um, and also, as I mentioned, the excitation is only at the focus so no emission pinhole is needed. This also means that descanning is not needed like in confocal imaging. So with a pinhole in confocal, the emission light needs to come back through the, the, the scanners so that it can be stationary and focused through the pinhole. And this, this is called descanning the emission beam, and it causes some of the emission light uh, to be lost, especially um, light that is scattered deep from within a tissue that can come back at an oblique angle into your um, scanning system. And then finally, higher energy photons, uh, or sorry, the higher wavelength photons for 2p excitation are less energy than the uh, 1p uh, photon counterpart. So the raster scanning is typically slow with traditional XY galbos where you can achieve maybe one to two frames a second at uh, 512 by 512 resolution. And you can crop and you can go faster by cropping down your, your field of view, but for full field imaging, um, resonant scanners are the way to go, um, where you can achieve about 30 frames a second for, for 512 by 512 resolution. So in addition to scanning and collecting images in, in 2D, of course you can collect uh, in 3D as well uh, with objective lenses that are mounted on piezo Z stages for uh, fast volumetric imaging. As you can see on the right here with some calcium imaging data of neural activity collected in 3D in multiple planes with, with a piezo um, from Michael Gord when he was in um, Maganka Sur's lab um, in, at MIT looking at neural activity in, in 3D. So that was a, a brief introduction to 2P imaging. And so all advances of two photon uh, in addition to being used for deep imaging with high SNR, it can be applied to photostimulation techniques as well. And at Bruker and as Prairie, we were fortunate enough to be part of the research that pushed the fields forward um, in, in optogenetics and in caging, and we're really um, proud of that. So the first uh, photostimulation technique uh, that I'd like to talk about is, is on caging, uh, specifically on caging of neurotransmitters like, like glutamate. It's a widely used technique in neuroscience that's used to study electrical activity uh, of living neurons and how their signaling works. And the way that it works is that a synthesized neurotransmitter uh, that is inactive is introduced to the neuron uh, with this cage group and represented by this this grayish block um, around each uh, neurotransmitter here. And it's engineered with a property that it's able to be cleaved uh, by UV light. So once um, UV light is shined in the area where you want to activate the neurotransmitter like glutamate, the molecules become uncaged and the neurotransmitter can diffuse to the spine of a dendrite where it has these uh, specific neurotransmitter receptors that it can bind to. So if it binds to a neurotransmitter, the ion channel opens up, allowing ions like sodium, potassium to flow um, intracellularly, uh, thereby changing the membrane uh, voltage potential. 
The result of this is that the membrane can depolarize and the cell can compute whether an action potential is fired if there are not enough of these um, input events. This membrane potential can be measured locally at the spine, for instance here, or at the dendrite, or further downstream, like at a cell body, replacing a patch clamp electrode in the cell, um, measuring its change in voltage. Also can be uh, measured um, indirectly uh, by calcium imaging. So one of the early papers in 2003 that shows this concept where a brain slide this was encaged was uh, done by using what was called the Prairie UV Uncager system at the time, um, where electrical potentials are measured along the dendrite with uh, patch clamp electrophysiology. So in this, in this paper, the authors are trying to, to map the distribution of these receptors, the receptors that you saw in the previous diagram, along the membrane, and therefore needed to accurately steer these UV uh, spots, the locations mapped um, in the imaging. So as you can expect at this time, 2P imaging was becoming more popular in the literature and the field recognized the potential of 2P excitation for improving the uh, localization of the uncaging. Um, and a lot of the pioneers in the field like Jeff McGee, um, Graham Lewis Davis, um, Attila Lasansky, and others developed and validated a lot of the 2P versions of the caged neurotransmitters on our system. So in addition to all the precision uh, that improved with 2P compared to, to 1P uncaging. Um, now users could use red light around 720 nanometers to do uh, the uncaging, which is a lot easier to deal with than, than UV uh, light from even a transmission standpoint. So a lot of this work in uncaging was facilitated a lot by the design of our Ultima in vivo microscope, which is the first uh, commercial 2P microscope to have multiple scanners in the system. So in addition to the um, imaging gallo set shown here, there's also an independent uncaging or photostimulation gallo set that can independently point and steer another laser beam while imaging. And so not only was the hardware developed to allow for these uh, photostimulation type experiments, uh, but also a lot of the software work that went into um, the calibration, accuracy, and mapping of all these different paths so that everything would coincide and be a co-aligned when imaging. So later on, we also added a resonant scanner module to allow for fast uh, uh, video rate frame rates with, with these photostimulation experiments. So shifting gears a little bit, uh, so with the development of encaging, we were pre in pretty good place um, for when uh, the birth of optogenetics happened in the mid-2000s at Stanford. So in short, to describe this a little bit, uh, Carl Dieseroth and his team at Stanford found that if they could get these light-sensitive transmembrane channel proteins called channel rhodopsins, uh, they could uh, express in, in neuronal cells. And so that when they shine blue light on these channels, they opened up um, and causing ions to flow into a cell and depolarize the membrane directly. And so similarly, um, the complement of these excitatory channel proteins, halorhodopsins, uh, were also uh, found to be expressed in, in, can be expressed in neuronal cells. And these were chloride pump uh, channel proteins that pump instead negative ions into the cell, inhibiting action potentials by hyperpolarizing the cells. So optogenetics found a similar, followed a similar track as, as uncaging did, and eventually optogenetic probes or opsins were developed that were redshifted and sensitive to 2P excitation as well. And we're also, again, proud that a lot of the early validation work was on in our Ultima system as well as some of the early seminal work that showed how these tools can be used to drive behavior in a living animal. And so, for instance, uh, this Nature Methods paper by Adam Packer in Michael Heuser's lab laid out a lot of the groundwork for um, carrying out this proof of concept experiment of relating uh, neural activity, optogenetic stimulation uh, with behavior um, in an animal.
And so in order to drive behavior, the thought was that more than a single cell needed to be activated at any given time point. And with the technology available, you could use uh, full field illumination, which is shown on the left, but is not cell specific. And the, spe the specificity came from more of the genetic engineering tools and the manipulation of the virus to selectively express opsins in a certain population of neurons. Or with um, technology in, the, in place at the time, you could use uncaging Galbo scanners like ours to hit uh, one cell and then jump to the next cell and then hit that one. And so the dream, of course, was whether you can activate multiple cells simultaneously at a single time when cells are separated in, in 3D. Uh, the dream experiment being that you'd be able to image neural activity in the animal and then stimulate key ensembles in neurons to drive behavior. So I think I was at a talk of uh, Rafa Eustis when he thought he put it best where it compares single cell activation to playing the piano with a single finger and what he's trying to do instead was to be able to play the chords of the um, neural network with two hands and all your fingers at once. And so we were very blessed to have great collaborators in taking on this challenge where uh, the Dezeroth lab, UC labs with Darcy Paterka, um, Michael Hoyser's lab, now Adam Packer, now in his own lab at uh, Oxford worked with us to bring this technology um, to the market. So you know, the technology that was identified to make this possible uh, was the uh, spatial light modulator, which is a liquid crystal and silicon chip that can be integrated into the light path of, of a microscope. So it's a pixelated and programmable sensor shown by this gray box here that can impart a phase to a beam at each pixel, which creates a custom wavefront before it goes through the lensing system of the rest of the um, microscope. So if you have an SLM off, the wavefront is not distorted and it results in a nice single focus in the sample. However, uh, the SLM allows you to program it with a phase mask and create multiple focus points of light in 3D space in the sample, in effect creating a uh, three-dimensional hologram um, within your specimen. So this was uh, really cool. So we tested out creating holograms in the shapes of cells to see what would activate. And something that we discovered was that um, if we created these holograms in complex uh, cell shapes, it enabled simultaneous activation, but it was limited to the number of cells you could hit. And so what everyone quickly realized was that for efficient 2P absorption of light, um, the power has to be high and the numerical aperture has to be high. And with complex holograms that you're trying to create with uh, spatial light modulators, it was just spreading out the light too much. And so the excitation was being diffused with these hologram masks. So this solution instead uh, was tied to our um, photostimulation path already in our system. So. Uh, the same photo simulation path that was used for uncaging experiments earlier, we're trying to reuse that for, for uh, solving this problem. So instead of creating these complex holograms, we instead create these point holograms of diffraction limited spots and couple the SLM with uh, what we at that time were calling uncaging galvos to scan those spots over an area. And so an example of this um, is a spiral pattern shown in this movie where Adam Packer creates um, 10 spots and then uses the, the galbos to spiral them around to hit, uh, for instance, cell bodies of, of, uh, of the mouse brain. And so to do this, uh, the stimulation shown here goes through a modulator, it can be a POCL cell, and then relayed to the SLM, and then uh, relayed to the uncaging galvos before again relayed to the back aperture of the objective. And so this allows for scanning of the holograms that I just showed um, in, in the movie, but also allows us to maximize the power uniformity of light delivery to the cell. Um, finally, it allows us to also move the galvos around to avoid 
issues with um, undifracted beams that come off of the um, SLM as well. And so to reinforce this uh, even further, the uh, picture on the left is uh, just the photostimulation beam ion, so nothing with the SLM or in Cajun Galvos at all. In the second picture, the SLM mask is applied to create the smiley face hologram um, in your sample. The third movie is the phase mask um, of the SLM applied and turned on, and the Galvos uh, scanning and the spirally pattern to create the, the area excitation. And then finally, the fourth movie is another ability for the Galvo system to jump and pan the hologram around to different spots in the field of view so it can actually shift your hologram in XY with these, um, with these occasion gobbles in the path. And so the Galvo hopping allows us to do a couple neat things with the SLM light delivery. Whereas if we um, didn't have the Galvo system, the cells at the edge of the field of view would suffer from intensity drop off at the SLM at the edges of the hologram. So for instance, on the left here, if you're trying to target cells that are um, further away from the center of your hologram, the cell that's kind of furthest at the edge would get less power than uh, the cells that were, say, closer to the um, center of your SLM. Whereas in our system, with the Galvos, with the Galvos in place coupled to the SLM, we can actually shift the center of the hologram closer to all the targets um, that are in your sample and then shoot from there. So with the many years now that we've been working on this, we're able to give a nice software interface that handles a lot of this complexity um, behind the scenes. So this is our Prairie View software that controls the SLM and it takes care of a lot of the complexity behind the scenes where the phase mass generation, the optimizing, the gavel location to be able to shoot the cells efficiently um, is all handled without the user needing to worry about that. And so what the user really just needs to worry about is where they want to place their targets. If they want to hit a point or if they want to hit like a spiral pattern shown here, how much laser power they want to use, and then for how long they want to um, apply the stimulation for. And so this is synchronized um, in timing with imaging. And so things are coupled together pretty seamlessly. Um, also, the holograms can be in three dimensions, like I mentioned. And so you can define the spots not only in 2D, but also in 3D. So you can move up and down, place your cells and the software handles, uh, being able to create the holograms in three dimensional space as well as 2D. So we get this question a lot too uh, about the lasers that uh, should be coupled with an SLM system. And what the field has kind of converged to is coupling SLMs with these low repetition rate, either from 500 kilohertz to all the way up to two, two or four megahertz, um, which allows you to hit tens to, uh, some have even demonstrated up to 100 cells simultaneously, uh, depending on the power of the laser. And so lasers at this, uh, with this high power, um, it's, uh, it's tough to use a POCL cell with it. So, um, lasers with integrated ALMs work really well. And so examples of some of these laser systems are shown here with the amp amplitude systems, Setsuma, the coherent Monaco, and spectrophysics spirit work really well. There are others that work well too. And so the um, imaging lasers that are typically used with 2P imaging that are um, have a pulse rate of 80 megahertz, we found that they aren't as sufficient for uh, multi-cell simulation uh, mostly because of the high rep rate and the lack of peak pulse power um, from these lasers. And so much of the energy from these 80 megahertz lasers is delivered as heat in the sample rather than efficiently activating opsins and generating photocurrents. And so in this last part, I'd like to introduce to you how our latest uh, workstation in the Ultima family and provides a next step for what's possible with the types of experiments I described, or even with 2P or 3P imaging in general. So with the 2P+, plus, we made several key enhancements. Uh, first of all, we increased the field of view in both Galvo and resident modes. We enhanced the collection efficiency with large close proximity detectors that we placed close to the back aperture of the objective. We re-engineered all the coatings with the options to get good transmission uh, up to 1,700 nanometers. Um, 
with the optical path, we all did this without compromising the optical imaging quality that we're known for. So you get good imaging quality, not only at the center of the field of view, but also at the edges. And then finally, we added features uh, to enable even more powerful SLM experiments with our, our new ETL liquid lens um, module. And so how big? Um, so for the field of view, we boosted the field of view to be 28 millimeter field number, which is about two millimeter diagonal with, for instance, a Nikon 16X objective or three millimeter diagonal with a 10X objective. And so this allows you to see more with every image and you can start making correlations between uh, distant portions of, of your sample. And so the really special thing is that we didn't just do this in a slow gallable mode for good structural imaging or high resolution imaging, but we also did this in a resonant mode to look at high speed dynamics of cells in the much larger uh, field of view. And so this was made possible by a custom engineered optical train um, with these giant lenses, the size of almost soda cans in, in the scan head. And so here's a, some data of calcium imaging with GCAM6 that Adam Packer graciously took for us showing off the big field of view and then and the uh, cellular activity in vivo. Um, so with the re-engineering effort, we redesigned new coatings uh, with good transmission up to 1700 nanometers. So if your uh, work takes you out to, to 3P, um, we're ready for it. And so in addition to a good transmission, we made sure that we had a uh, good diffraction limited performance at all wavelengths as well, shown by um, this black ring representing the, the airy disk or the, uh, the focus of your optical system. Uh, so, so we have made sure that we have good diffraction limited performance at all wavelengths um, and also not just at the center of the field of view, but also at the edge of your field of view as well. So you have good focusing capability, which is really important for, for 2P, but even more important for, for 3P excitation. And so part of this validation that we do is that we validate the flatness of the field where we're making, uh, where we're imaging uh, a flat region rather than curveball and making sure that we do that. Um, sometimes with a larger field of view systems, you end up imaging um, a bowl uh, kind of shape near the edges of your field of view that uh, where something is in focus at their center of your field of view might not be in focus at the edge of your field of view. And so in order to do this, we image a monolayer of beads to make sure that we're able to see beads at the edges. And we do this not only in, in Galvo mode, uh, but also in, in resonant mode. So in addition to being useful for um, functional imaging, this large field of view can speed up acquisitions of montages as well. Um, so with the standard field of view, for instance, this 15 millimeter by five millimeter section would have taken about 108 tiles uh, to do with the standard field number 18 uh, uh, kind of field of view. But with the 2P plus, it could be done in only 44 tiles And so the power here, of course, is uh, with these tile montages, you can see that the context of uh, where you're trying to image your specific area, but you can also uh, look at an individual tile specifically to get cellular detail and look at the structure um, uh, with greater resolution. So of course, in this new system would be missing something if it didn't have the SLM capabilities. And so we brought forward the technology that we developed with our collaborators. So now the experiments can benefit from all the advances of the 2P plus field of view, collection optics, the broadband compatibility of, of, uh, of all our optics now. Also, the SLM is a module. And so like previously, um, you can start off your research with simply calcium imaging and add this uh, neural light SLM module onto your research if your research takes a direction of, of photo stimulation or 3D uh, photo manipulation in the future. So one of our newest users, uh, Dr. Ahmet Arak at UCL, UCLA graciously provided us with some of this awesome data using the 2P plus to look at uh, cellular activity in vivo. 
And so using the new option that just came out of Stan uh, Stanford, Carmine, and GCAMP6 looking at uh, the motor cortex, he's able to map out delta F over F traces of many of the cells in the field of view. So first here, he's looking at a field of view of 500 microns by 500 microns um, at really high resolution and looking at the correlations of, of many cells. And here he's looking at 117 ROIs, he looks at, uh, it looks like, and trying to make correlations of, of the activity um, in vivo. And so it's just beautiful data. And then here, with a larger field of view, he's looking at even more cells in a 1.1 um, millimeter by 1.1 millimeter area. And with this data set, he's also using the SLM coupled with a low repetition uh, laser that I mentioned that has high peak power to stimulate 80 cells in total while looking at the uh, calcium traces uh, here. And so again, delta F over F. And the simulation is happening um, at the time points indicated by these, these vertical bars. And so as you, when um, you see a kind of a flash in the, in the uh, calcium movie, that's when uh, Amit is uh, stimulating multiple cells at once in the groups that he describes. So he's doing eight groups of 10 cells uh, with five revolutions of a, a spiral scan, uh, one repetition of the spiral at each group for 2.6 milliseconds. And so uh, the interface allows you to define exactly the laser power that you want to use, the type of uh, area that you want to stimulate for the duration that you're able to stimulate. And so it's, again, really cool data that, um, that just came out of, of the UCLA lab. And so just to give you a context of the cells that he's looking at, this is just static images uh, showing where he's uh, placing these regions of interest and looking at the, uh, the uh, calcium activity um, in, in this greater context. So the yellow dots on the right here are the 80 cells that he's stimulating in the groups that it was described. And again, this is using GCAMP6 and Carmine that came out of uh, the uh, science paper um, from Jim Marshall and Dizaroth group. So another piece of data that's just really exciting is that our users at the University of Washington, Charles and Vijay and Garrett Stuber's lab have demonstrated how this SLM technique can be done through grin lenses, which are implantable lenses in the animal uh, to enable even deeper imaging than with uh, 2 px excitation alone. And so with even just the 20x air objective, at, I think it's like 0 0.4, 0 0.5 NA, they're able to resolve cells and get, get good holographic stimulation with a live animal. So this will enable a lot of uh, new experimentation in the future. So a new module that I'd like to introduce you to on the TP Plus is our ETL module, which stands for Electrically Tunable Lens. Um, ETLs are liquid lenses that can vary its curvature and thereby its focal length depending on the electrical signal that it gets. And so this allows for fast changing of focus without needing to change the uh, position of the objective lens. Um, our module is implemented as a decoupled module. That is, it's only in the resonant path, which allows for some, some neat things um, with the SLM, as I'll explain. And so on the right here is a beautiful uh, projection that uh, was taken by Dustin Herman in Michael Heuser's lab, University of College London, where it shows that typically liquid lenses are associated with uh, inferior imaging quality because it's a liquid lens uh, that doesn't have um, as great properties for imaging as uh, a traditional glass lens, but we've corrected for a lot of the imperfections in liquid lenses with uh, custom aspheric lenses and custom drivers that are able to drive the ETL um, at, uh, at faster speeds. And so uh, to explain a bit about how these uh, SLM experiments have been done in the past with, with traditional Z-Stack imaging uh, with an SLM, as the user, the user first chooses targets they want to stimulate in, in 3D with the SLM by choosing the phase mask that they put onto the SLM chip. However, if they try to take a Z-Stack 
in a traditional way by moving the objective down um, after these masks are applied, the mask also would uh, shift by the amount that you move the objective lens down. And so um, this is the same for a traditional Z motor, uh, like a stepper motor, or a piezo, um, piezo stage attached to the objective, um, that it's going to shift the, the hologram that you put in your sample down by uh, this amount. So you couldn't really do it simultaneously, um, imaging and volumetric stimulation. And so a lot of times what happens is instead you would start imaging. You would then stop your imaging and then do your photo simulation. And then you would um, restart your imaging again. And so what this ETL allows for, since it's decoupled from the objective lens and it's decoupled from your photo simulation and it's only in the imaging resonant path, is that even if the user chooses the neurons to stimulate in 3D, and then they want to change the focal plane by changing the ETL focus, they're able to do that without disturbing the, um, the photo stimulation pattern that you, you just set up. And so this really allows for true simultaneous 3D photo stimulation while imaging, um, allowing for even more powerful experiments. And with that, I'd like to end with just a summary of the 2P+, um, the enhancements that we, we implemented in this new architecture that um, allows for a lot of these um, you enhance experiments. And with that, I'd like to open it up to um, any questions that you may have about the system, 2P, optogenetics, or encaging in general. Um, so I thank you for your attention and joining. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll start the question section and see if there are any questions. And so I have one question. Uh, let's see. Will the pixelated nature of the SLM significantly reduce the resolution of the holographic simulation? And so let's answer that one first. Yeah, and so the, the SLM, um, it, actually the pixels kind of correlate, since it's in the Fourier space of the imaging system, the number of pixels correlate to the field of view that you're able to achieve. And so with the smaller number of pixels, you're able to diffract the beam further to address things uh, further out um, at the edges of your field of view. However, if the pixels are too small, they basically can introduce crosstalk. Um, and so if you get your pixels too small and try to get a big field of view, you have crosstalk between adjacent pixels, which ends up uh, causing a lot of drop off in your, um, in your, in your uh, the SLM uh, field of view of intensity. And so kind of our solution to the SLM in general is to couple it into the Gallo system so that we can use bigger pixels, right? And so the bigger pixels that give you a better uniformity um, of intensity across your field of view. But if you need to address uh, cells that are at the edge of the field of view, you can actually pan or center your hologram um, at the edges of, of your field of view in order to hit those efficiently. And number two, is it possible to use an SLM or maybe a deformable mirror to enhance the resolution of a single focus spot? And it is. And so this is the technique of uh, adaptive optics, right? where there are going to be um, wavefront distortions introduced along any optical path. And the idea there is that you're able to use an SLM and a lens function to create a correction for um, any of these aberrations to get a better focus spot. And so a lot of the, S, the adaptive optics implementations that have been out there, they're a little bit slow. And so you kind of have to correct for the aberrations uh, if you change your sample, if you change focal planes. And so it's, it kind of interferes with a lot of the workflow that a lot of users have, but it's theoretically possible in any system with, with an SLM that's conjugated to the um, back aperture of the objective like ours. Let's see. So and that's all the questions I can see. Um, um, that's a, the, any... uh, so, um, Jimmy. 
Yep. So the next question is, um, can an Altima in 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 vitro or mm -hmm. in vivo, moving in vivo, be converted to Altima 2P plus? Um, so it's we're willing to entertain any trade-in type programs. It's for the 2P plus. We actually re-engineered so much of it uh, that it'd be really difficult to um, to upgrade it in the field, uh, as you would say. And so it's we're in, if you're or interested in kind of the capabilities of 2P plus, definitely contact uh, one of our, our specialists. We can uh, help help you work through that. Um. Um, Jimmy, I'm gonna read another one. Um, sure. How yeah. fast can, can see the more. SLM jump from one programming to another? And so there's uh, right now we have uh, it's called an overdrive technology and this custom SLM uh, that we um, that we had. Uh, built by our, our partners at uh, Boulder Nonlinear Systems, and it really depends on uh, the transition of the phase mass. Some phase mass transition from if you're trying to hit these certain cells and to these other cells, it might be faster than say uh, another set of, of transitions. And so, typically, it's uh, for usable holograms in um, in microscopy. For us, it's like anywhere from um, four to seven milliseconds or so. Okay. Um, next question is, um, you talked mostly about activation. Is it possible to yep. combine two-photon inhibition with imaging? Yeah, and so a lot of the inhibition, um, the, the probes, the options have been uh, on the 1P side. Um, and I think the limiting thing more, is more on the, um, the probes, the options for uh, the complementary to the channel redopsins or the halo redopsins, so the family of halo redopsins that they uh, improve on the um, engineer on the kind of the molecular engineering side. They can be used, and then we also have capabilities on our um, SLM in that we're able to change the uh, lookup table on it to uh, be more efficient at uh, different wavelengths, and so we can change that for you in order to um, address uh, different options that may come out in the future. All right. Um, I have like tons of questions. It's just the list is growing. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, oh, I don't actually see them. So if you could read them. Maybe great. you can refresh the window. But yeah. Um, what is the excitation medium in slide 21 that allows you okay. to image the stimulation pattern? Let me go back to slide 21. Actually, I have to ask Adam. It might have been fluorescine. Um, it might have been a bath of fluorescine uh, that he's exciting with, with 3D. I don't quite remember uh, what it is, but you can also achieve a similar effect by using a, these plastic fluorescent chroma slides that uh, um, you can get from uh, uh, chroma. Okay. Um, so next question: uh, Can you explain mm -hmm. more? how the zero order block is taken care of. When the galvo moves the pattern, will spots in the center of the pattern be blocked? Sure. Yeah, and so it's they're not blocked and it's kind of the something that I, I went through really quickly. Yeah, so I apologize. The zero order block is, um, of course, would create a shadow um, in your field of view at the center um, if you didn't account for it. And so with our galvo system, we can actually uh, basically offset that um, by shifting the galvo and then create a hologram mask to shift things back. And so we have uh, this way to um, offset this uh, shadow to be away from your stimulation and then uh, kind of use the hologram programming, uh, the SLM, to shift things back so that you can hit um, uh, places in your field of view without worrying about a shadow. Okay, thank you. And then uh, next question is, uh, can the microscope head or objective rotate to other angles? If it does, yes. what is the angle range? Angel, angle, angle, no. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And so uh, we have options for, and so standard is actually uh, a manual rotation. And so you can uh, grab the uh, nose piece, uh, make it bigger, and then rotate it to the angle that's specific to uh, that's more useful for um, like an animal. Um, and if, for instance, your surgery uh, isn't perfect, isn't perfect orthogonal, you can rotate the nose piece to, to um, the 
new angle. And also we have motorized option where if you need that precision and repeatability every single time of rotation, we have options now on, on the 2P Plus to rotate it uh, by uh, typing in the degrees of rotation that you want in the software. And you can rotate up to not quite 90 degrees, I think it's like 88 degrees on either side. Okay, I'm just trying to. So there is a question. Um, during the imaging from the ARAC lab, it seems that photo stimulation using the SLM resulted in some light contamination. Why is that? Yeah, and so it's uh, so a lot. So a lot of this 1040 um, excitation can it can do uh, can induce some autofluorescence, and also it's some these. PMTs are really sensitive, so it picks up um, some of the light, even with uh, a lot of the, the glass design to, to block it out. Um, in order to mitigate some of the lines even further, we have uh, high-speed shutters that can be placed in front of the PMTs that uh, can and turn off, uh, basically shutter the PMT uh, from any light contamination during uh, the photo simulation. Um, but yeah, it's, you, see, you see some of the uh, slight light uh, artifacts that are caused by uh, excitation lasers. Um, so Jimmy, I have many questions about the refresh uh, rate for the SLM, so maybe you can just sure. repeat that. Uh, I think um, we had that question sure. from Johannes already, but yeah, um, go ahead. Sure, yeah, and so it, uh, it depends on the um, hologram that you're, uh, that you're hologram that you're on and your next hologram. And so this transition is easier um, for um, certain sets of current and next holograms and others, but in general for holograms that are um, uh, kind of useful for uh, uh, creating cells and mass, it seems like it's anywhere from uh, four to seven milliseconds. Um, and then there's there are ways that we're trying to, to make that even faster too. So if that's a limitation for you, it's there's we're trying to uh, speed things up. Um. Okay, thank you. And then there is a question about um, collection optics. So in the presentation mm -hmm. of the design of Ultima 2P+, you mentioned that the collection optics have been optimized. Do you have any quantification mm -hmm. of it in comparison with Ultima Investigator, for example? Yeah, and so it's uh, so the Ultima Investigator redesigned the collection optics uh, first on the Investigator and brought them forth to the Ultima 2P. And so the Ultima Investigator should have the same collection optics as, as the Ultima 2P+. Yeah, the difference is size, right? Like there is more larger optics. Oh, yeah, optics so the now. smallest, yeah, yeah so the smallest optic that's in the emission path is, I think, 50 millimeters. And so it's, um, yeah, so it's really big optics. So I think um, this is all the questions. Um, that, and you did answer them. Um, I think we are in the, at the end of the presentation. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Jimmy, for this very informative presentation. I, um, I hope, thank you so much for joining this morning, uh, that Monday morning. So um, please uh, contact us if you have more detailed questions. Um, there is information on the website. Uh, you can always call FM support at brooker.com uh, for more detailed information about the products or any applications questions. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Yep, thank you, everyone.